Hello everyone and welcome to Journal for Jills. My name is Lewis and in today's episode of JFG Meets we have former Gillingham forward Bob Taylor on the show. Obviously, unfortunately, due to the current coronavirus pandemic we were apart when having the chat so it did have to be a phone interview but do stay tuned for inside stories on non-league experiences, joining Norwich, settling down at Orient and Brentford, the team at Gillingham, his relationship with Tony Pulis, that playoff final, leaving the club, getting promoted with City, missing out on Premier League football, a nightmare time at Wolves, coaching, being a football agent and more. Enjoy. So we're now joined by former Gillingham forward Bob Taylor. Bob, thank you for coming on. How are you, how are you doing at the minute? Uh, yeah, no, no, no worries at the moment. Sort of like just a bit, bit surreal, isn't it? This all stuff that's going on in the world at the moment. But um, yeah, we're coping okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's strange. But hopefully we can provide a little bit of entertainment, give, give people their football fix um, with a little chat today. So we'll start at the beginning. Um, yeah. why, why football? How did you get into football? <laughs> Uh, I played from an early age, about five or six years of age, for uh, a, a town called Motton in Norfolk, and um, I sort of grew up playing to the, the, the younger teams, and I managed to get into the adult teams when I was 13, because at that age, at that time, you could play any age group at adult football. Yeah. Um, so I was 13, playing for Rotten Reserves and everything like that, and when I got to 15, I was playing for the first team, who were in the old Eastern Counties League, which was a very strong league at the time. Um, and we used to get a lot of crowd watching us and that kind of thing and it's just that we uh, we, we played a Norwich City 11 on a Tuesday night in a friendly one night and we drew to all and I scored a couple of goals in that and uh, it's sort of like you know spiral from there really I, they were after me and I was playing for the county team at the time and scoring goals for the county so I had about 30 odd clubs wanting me to sign YTS forms and I didn't really want to play football I wanted to be a chef funny enough okay. I wanted to have my own, res- wanted to have my own restaurant and everything like that oh, and wow. um, so yeah so when I was at school I'd done the cooking courses and things like that and I uh, really enjoyed that and yeah and it just just happened just like that at Norwich so I signed for Norwich because they were local and uh, you know and that was it it went from there really yeah, so it spiralled pretty quickly. Then it sounds like sort of playing for yeah. water and then moving on to Norwich. Did you have to move away when you went to Norwich, or did you did you stay at home as well? Yeah, no, we we had to go and stay in Digs. We weren't allowed to stay at home. I was only twenty one miles away from Norwich, but we still had to go stay in Digs in Norwich. Um, you know, and um, I stayed in Digs for um, three years. Um, done a two year YTS and then I done a year's pro. Uh, Norwich, and then I got released with probably a 50-50 split of the coaching staff. Um, and then I remember going to Leighton Orient just about two, three days after that. And then I think three or four months later, they tried to buy me back. Um, wow. I made a mistake, and I said no because I was, you know, they didn't want me in the first place. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I'd make it on my own, so I did. Yeah. No, fair play to you. Fair play to you. Um, just rewinding a bit to when you went to Norwich. How was it moving away from home? Because, like you say, you were quite young. Yeah, it was, it was it was difficult because you're not used to your home comforts and living in someone else's house with two other children in the house of their children as well it was a bit daunting really. You didn't know whether to come down and have tea with them or just stay in your bedroom or, or or what. That was a bit you yeah. know you couldn't do your own thing, you couldn't relax or nothing like that. So it was hard and and um, you know sort of mum and dad would come up there and visit me now and again sort of thing during the weeks and or come and take me out for something to eat or whatever but it's just you feel feel like you're isolated on your own a lot and you know it does did get you down and um, you know you have to try and come through that and I think that's the whole growing up uh, thing in football that you're tested all the, all the way along and you've got to try and go over that and become a man quickly and and that's what, what I've done really is just try to grow up quickly and look after myself yeah, yeah, I think you do have to go up, go up pretty quickly. Um, and like you say, you weren't at Norwich for too long, but I think it was at Ori- Orient you made your pro debut. Um, do you remember making your debut as a professional? Um, to be honest with you, I can't remember the debut I made at late Norwich, to be honest with you, I can't remember. Um, and I just remember uh, playing, I started up front, I think I ended up playing left side of the field, I think, and played sort of... Like, uh, two years left side of the field, I think. So I sort of mainly played the reserves at Norwich, so not not the youth team really. And I sort of like went into the reserves. There were so many strikers at the club. Um, you know, you had Flecky, you had um, Robert Rosario, you had Dean Coney, you had Henrik Mortson, you had Malcolm Allen. You know, all players who played in Division One, which was the old Premiership, well, the Premiership, the old Division One. Then I uh, sort of played left side of the field, and I finished the high scorer still playing left side of the field yeah. uh, the season. So you know, and that's what the argument was about. I'm scoring goals and everything like that, and you know, and I'm, I'm scoring goals, and you've got strikers who are sort of like Premiership standard. And, um, you know, I'm scoring more goals than what they are playing that, that position. Yeah. Um, so when I went to Leighton Orient, sort of like, obviously they see me play left side of midfield and I played there and I scored goals from there as well. So, 
you know, it's just it's just one of the things you got to adjust just to play football, really. You know, it doesn't matter where I played, as long as I was in the eleven, I didn't care. At Orient, do you feel like you settled a bit more and found a bit more of a home sort of thing? I think I was only like just nineteen, nearly twenty years of age, and I went at Diggs then as well uh, with a family. Um, they were a nice family. I felt more relaxed there. I don't know why I just did. Um, I had my own sort of like big room I had. And that kind of stuff there, and uh, so you jump on a train and you're in London, sort of thing. So when you can go and visit stuff, go and do stuff um, better than you could at Norwich at the time. And yeah. um, I think then you learn, you learn, learn the bus timetables and all things like that. You haven't got your mum and dad to drive you around anywhere or yeah. things like that. So you just got to learn to, to go out. I was catching trains at half six on a Monday morning from, from Norfolk, from Watton itself, when I've been home, and catching trains at half six from Norwich to London, getting on the tubes, all that kind of stuff, and tubing it in for 10 o'clock, you know, training. Yeah. Um, so I've done that near enough every Monday morning. Um so it's, it, was, it was difficult, but, you know, stuck at it and just got something to look forward to is playing football. So that's what you know, drove you on, really. Yeah. And I know you had quite a big chunk of your career at Brentford and I want to get to Gillingham and for time for time's sake. We're going to maybe skim over it a little bit. But how was your time at Brentford and what are your memories from your time there? I enjoyed it. Um, I remember scoring my first goal, which was a, a lob. Um, for about 30 yards I think um, but I remember coming off um, I think I, had a, I just strained my hamstring a little bit but we were in the game 4-0 I think at the time or something like that or 2-0 or something and I come off with about 20 minutes to go a bit tight hamstring because obviously when you're like, moving around not playing so much, like you're moving club to club you're not playing you're not in the, the, the club's plans and I sort of like was playing at Orient but then all this come about me moving I, I missed a game or two and then sort of like went to for Brentford uh, and then you played and you missed sorry, two weeks really good training and two games so I had a bit of a tight hamstring but that was only a precaution but then from then on um, I enjoyed my time there it's, it's played with some good players at the club uh, we had good success we had, a, we had a strong squad there but then we um, obviously got to Wembley against um, Crew and lost in the final that was, that was a bit of a uh, bit of a shock for everybody and we lost in the final to them and um, and then the final season got relegated because all the players left yeah. in the summer yeah, yeah, that, that's the case like that, isn't it, sometimes? 1998, the move to Gillingham, um, get on to the, the main part of the interview. How how did the move come about? Um, came, I mean, Ron knows to go to Brentford and um, come in and he brought in some good coaching staff and I started, the, sort of the pre-season started, I had a couple of days and, um, and it was just sort of like there was no players coming in and I'd done another day of pre-season training and then sort of like got a bit of a on the hard ground I always get tendonitis and Achilles on hard ground right. um, and so I didn't train for a few days they was trying to get me to stay for longer and offer me more money it's, it's like trouble my wages and things like that to keep me at the club uh, sign on fees gold bonuses everything like that to keep me there but it wasn't what drove me on you know we got relegated uh, players left you know five or six I think six or seven players left to be fair left the club and there's no one coming in with any quality really uh, he brought in the end they did bring some people in but for me it wasn't what I wanted at the time, you know, I didn't yeah. want to play low, lower league football and that, because I wanted to play as hard as I can, like every player would do. Yeah. I just said, look, I, I want to I wanna go, I want to I play higher. And obviously, Tony Pulis was after me, and I had the Gillingham lads who went to uh, Gillingham, you know, Brent, sorry, the Brentford lads that went to Gillingham were on the phone to me all the time, um, you know, just keep on saying to me, oh, Tony really wants you over, we want you to play, come here, we want you to come here, you know, get the boys back together and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, in the end, they put a bid in, it was accepted, I think, and then I, I went there. Yeah. So you went for, I believe it was about £500,000 at the time, which is a lot, yeah. of, is a lot of money now for a club like Jim. Yeah. Did you feel the pressure having that price tag over you or not? Um, the other thing I was worried about was my fitness, really, because I know I had done a pre-season, that was like three or four weeks later, yeah. um, that I'd, uh, I'd come across and I was working in the morning, working in the afternoon, trying to get myself fit. Tony was working with me in the afternoons on the bikes in the gym, fitness stuff in the gym every afternoon. And, um, you know, and it's just games that do get you fit because matches, matches do get you fully fit. And it doesn't matter how many um, uh, pre-seasons you do and six weeks of really running, that gives you a base. But it's the games that get you match fit and your sharpness. Yeah. So I missed out on all, all the pre-season friendlies and everything like that. You see, I didn't do anything like that. So going into games... And he said, you'll get fit, don't worry about that, you'll play every game until you're fit. <laughs> That's what he said to me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and he just said to everybody else, he said to the press, once he's fit, you'll see the best of him. 
and the players said the exact same thing all stuck up for me at the time when it was a bit of a hard hard start which I knew it was going to be a hard start because I'd done nothing and I remember after about 20 minutes of one game I felt I was going to throw up everywhere be yeah. sick everywhere on the side of the pitch and um, because people don't realise what that yeah, how fit you have to be you know to, yeah. to play football yeah. and if you're not fit you're not going to compete in it at all you're not going to stand out you're not going to be the best player you can yeah. And um, and that was the case, and then suddenly I, you know, got myself after seven, six, seven, eight games, and then you know I was flying after that. Really, just just got my fitness, and I felt sharp. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know how how it's that you are with the current Gillingham situation, but we were struggling for goals and we brought in John Akinde in January and people sort of like, no, he's got the record as a goal scorer and he's only got one goal so far and people sort of like, oh, he's not doing it. But then Steve Evans has constantly said like, when he's fit, you'll see what he can do, that sort of thing. So it's all, yeah. about, all about getting fit, that sort of thing. Um, that is, once you're fit, you're sharp. Your mind, your mind's sharp and you can think quicker and that's, that's how it is. Yeah, mentally as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, so how was it under Tony Pulis? Obviously, he had some pretty good times. If you had to summarise his his management style, that sort of thing, your relationship with him. Um, he, he's he's a hard man. He wants perfection all the time. If, if you're going through a bad time, there's any problems with it. Like, you know, he knows how to deal with the man management side of it. Was good for him. That's why he got the best out of the players he had. Yeah. Um, at the time, and we had a very good squad at the time. Boys were very close, and he he done that by you know picking the right players to be together. Yeah. As a manager, you have to you know be you know as a manager, you have to pick a side that will gel together and stick together. No matter what, don't, they don't have to be the best players in the world. Um, as long as they give only ten percent every week, and it's what he, how he wants to play is what players he has to bring in. So yeah. you're bringing in someone who's a ball player, and you go long. Yeah. You know, in midfield, you somebody plays football in midfield, but then you hit the ball forward, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Or you bring in someone who can run all day in midfield, but you try and play and he can't play. So he's, he's got the balance spot on, you know, and um, and that's what you have to view it as. Yeah. And if you come in players and you see supporters go, why don't we go after him? Why don't we go after him? He might not have plan, might not fit in what the manager wants. So and how the team plays so it's you know people say oh he's free he's free go after him go after him it's, it's not as easy as that yeah yeah so, absolutely yeah. and we'll obviously come on to how how that season went but what were the ambitions would you say at the start of the campaign um, I don't know really it's just uh, I don't think you know get up there and about I suppose like everyone else does you know just I mean by the time you get to new year turn of the new year where you are if you're in, in around that top six you've got half a chance yeah. turn of the year you know, it's a Christmas beer. What's a killer for your body? Um, it, it puts everyone like uh, a bit of a like a Grand National race. Really, the first hurdle is the is a crucial thing for a rider. Whether you jump it or you you, you you fall, and I think the Christmas period is like that in football. And if you get past that Christmas period and you're still in there with a the shout, you know, turn of the new year, you you've only got sort of four months then to. Um, you know, to push, and uh, you can see everything that's going to pan out after the new year. And, uh, and nine times out of ten, the league stays as it is. If you know what I mean, or play yeah. the, the top six or top seven teams stay up that in that top seven spot because they start up in the game a bit. They've got a taste. You know, they've got a they got, they've got a taste of getting into the playoffs or into a promotion uh, position. Yeah. So it's um, everyone steps up after after the new year. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I mean, end of the day, when you turn new year, you think I've got we've got a chance here, and that's what that's what happens every year with anything. You've got a chance getting well, you've got a chance getting the playoffs, and uh, and then everyone, you know, it, it's very accelerates, and um, and just that's that's the way it works, really. Yeah, and I know people always talk about certain things when it comes to Bob Taylor at Gillingham, such as the the, the day at Burnley, that sort of thing. Um, something yeah. I wanted to ask you about is. Something that my dad says to me, just for context, like you, you were playing for the listeners. You were playing for Gillingham before, before I, um, not I think it was just yeah. just as I was born, but um, before my time. And my dad always, always, always talks about your partnership with Carla Saba. Um, yeah. How would you summarise your relationship? Um, it's, it's just it's one of the things I had to play some bit of both as well. Nicky Forster left the club, and then yeah. um, uh, then Carl come along. And uh, he was at the club, he couldn't get in the first team at the time. And then Nicky came, he had a chance, and we could see him training, they could finish. And he was sort of like, he wasn't as strong to start off with, he was like pushed off the ball, that kind of thing. And he got in the gym, built himself up, and then no one could knock him off the ball as strong as an ox, you know. So he knew what his weaknesses were, and he worked on them. And um, Carl was one of them players that uh, learned very, very, you know, things very, very quickly. And, um, 
you know, I learned how he played, he learned how I played, and we sort of fed off each other that way. And you know, and um, just the, just the chemistry that was just good on the pitch and, and off that we got well off the pitch. Well, all the boys got on well with each other anyway. So it's a it's a good thing we we did, and everyone felt comfortable around each other. You yeah. know, um, yeah. so it wasn't like you have to go sit in the corner and be quiet. You can do what you want. Yeah. You know, and and you feel relaxed, like you're at home, sort of thing. That's how that's how it felt. You do what you your own thing. It's just one of them things where you could do anything, and the boys were in better eyelid at it because you're just all so close. We've, we've known each other for years as well, most of us, and most of the boys there I played against anyway when I went there. So um, it's um, it's good camarader- camaraderie there, and uh, just you know, with me and Carl just sort of like gelled and. Same with the Roma part, strike partners, really. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was a good partnership between us both, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously I've done my research and seen stuff like that, but a lot of people say to me, like, you you missed out not seeing that partnership. So, obviously, um, those people <laughs> those people must have enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So, we'll move to, to the the end of that season, the playoff final. Yeah. Um, yeah. You scored. It hurts to talk about it still. Um, like I say, yeah. before my time, but like I can only imagine yeah. being there at the day. And my mum my and my dad talk about it a lot. Um, it always yeah. comes around every year when the playoffs the playoffs start. They show that that game on the TV, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Against Man City, what do you remember from the day? Um, I mean, to end the day, we were the underdogs on the on the day. We didn't expect to get anything out of it. The people were saying that would be four, three, four, five nil. They were saying yeah. City would be too strong, you know, for us and this kind of thing. But you know, we, we just we just had a team that. Won't get beat half the time, you know. Half the games we played, and uh, losing the game would come back and, and win it. Um, but that was just a, a surreal day. Really, didn't realise, you know, when you're out there, what, what happened. You think, is that just happened? You know, it didn't sink in to three or four days later after the game. That, yeah. you know. Um, but at the time, it was a great day out for everybody for the club and that kind of thing. We we put on a good show. You know, City were there. Uh, money they spent, you know, they've got money to spend on players and that kind of stuff. You know, we went out there, they had some good players in their team, very good players in their team. Um, and it was just one of them days that the sun shone on Manchester because they had to Manchester United as well in the Champions League. They come from behind and won. Yeah. And there were two late goals. So it was just a week that, you know, it was shine on, on, on the main Cunians at the end of the day. But we, um, we put a good show on that day. You know, we scored two goals. Um, and we thought we'd won it. You know, I remember Carl sliding over and goes, "We're going up, we're going up." He's like, "Oh, God, oh, God, oh we should have said that, Carl." <laughs> you know, yeah. I just remember him sliding over and saying it. He starts um, get that feeling that they could get my goal here, and then we could be in trouble. But I just feel there was a wrong move on on changing players and taking players off okay. at, at the wrong times, and and um, I think that's what cost us really because um, I think. Tony took off Carlos Sada and then the full backs were getting forward because we went narrow we went six at the back so the full backs were pushing on and uh, we were getting dragged out of position a bit and made, there was a hole in the middle of the pitch because our midfield players were getting dragged out to the full backs yeah. and I couldn't run across the one full back to the other full back <laughs> yeah. um, you know in time to stop them doing it so I just had to stay in the middle of the pitch but I was watching it pan out and I could see we were getting dragged away dragged out and there's the big holes in the middle and I think if we'd kept the five across them, you know, kept the solid um, team we had, and us being Carl stop and get the full backs out, they had to come and try and get through the middle where we were strong to start off with. But because our midfield balls were getting dragged out to the full backs, there's even holes. Yeah. And that's where we weren't compact enough. Yeah. And then and then the full backs had to push on a bit to get their full. You know, it was just all, we started losing our shape a lot. And um, I just think it's a bit of confusion at the back, too many bodies, and they got the ricochets and, and things, and it fell to them. But yeah, it was a, um, a good day playing at Wembley, but a bad result for, yeah. for everybody. Um, so, yeah. And I know I know you'd moved on by then, but it must have been been good seeing Gillingham get, get the promotion the year after. <laughs> Yeah, it was. I mean, I was there to October and, um, you know, we, we kept, this, everyone was together still, kept the same team together. Yeah. And we, it was, it was, it, uh, we got off to a slow start. Um, obviously just, to, um, you know, from backlash from the year before, you know, everyone still couldn't believe the players come in. So we should be playing championship football now and this kind of thing, but things, things happen. Yeah. And um, but I'm pleased for the club that they went up the following season because they had a good side to go and do that, good enough squad to go and do that, and they did so. That's good. Yeah, 
And I know you've been back to Priestfield recently as a legend, that sort of thing. And I know people give you lots of compliments on social media, that sort of thing. Um, how yeah. is it being remembered so positively by the Gingham fans and how would you assess your relationship with them? I don't know really. I just I just enjoy playing football for for the club and, and you know because first of all we had a bit of a few, not all supporters but a lot of people doubt me at the start and that kind of thing. But it was yeah. nice to turn it around and and then appreciate me afterwards and and swallow a bit of pride as you say uh, and say yeah I wasn't bad footballer. <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, but yeah but it's nice it's nice to come down there and see everybody and, and get well like you know and I uh, get out of Brentford quite a bit as well to enjoy my time there as well and um, but. Doing them just just tops it for me, as in the support, the the players there, the the, the club, um, just the just it's a home feeling throughout. Even you know supporters being there. I mean, we used to get nearly a full house every week watching us play. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because uh, we were a side that people like to come and watch, and it's just it's it, you know I'll come down and just wish I was still playing. So, yeah, but yeah. it's um, yeah. So it's just well, thanks to the supporters to um, you know who appreciate me for what I do at the club, and um, just hopefully they can like you know please can turn it around at the club and get him promoted uh, next season. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I think he will if he if he stays there long enough. I think he will get his yeah. for that. That'd be good. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that you started the following season at Gillingham, but the departure, t- ironically, to Manchester City. Um, how did that come yeah. around? You've got eight months uh, previous and sort of like. February on to about October time, I think it went on to till then, uh, from then till then, and um, then putting bids in for me okay. and wanted me to sign. Uh, there's other clubs as well coming in, um, but it's just like, like, like I said before, you want to play at the highest level. But I wanted to stay, I wanted to stay at the club because I could see us going up to, to the championship that season. Yeah, but um, it's all, all about money, really, isn't it, at the end of the day. So it wasn't. It wasn't like they're just coming off that game. They're already interested before before the playoff game, anyway. Yeah, before yeah, before the playoff game, they've been they're putting bids in before that, and yeah. uh, there's other clubs doing the same. Uh, you know, you hear things through your agent at the time as well. Yeah, but it didn't put me off. You know, I just wanted to play football. Yeah, continue playing with the club, and um, you know we were. You know, I was just want, I was sitting down trying to sort something out and see if they could sort a new deal out for me. That, but they couldn't sort one out. So. You know. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. And yeah. City goes straight back up again. Um yeah. how was that that campaign? Oh, that was an unbelievable campaign. It all happened so quickly, you know, one's minute you're lost in the playoff final and then you get to play for Man City and then you get promoted to yeah. the premiership. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, What the hell's going on here? And yeah. you know, I found it difficult there as well at settings. You got you, you know, I was travelling up from uh, Kent to Manchester most days. Right, wow. You know, so, yeah. So until we to the sort of their place out and they put us in rented accommodation. So we had two, one house down there trying to sell another one up there and family, you know, it was, it was just a nightmare for three or four months. Then we found somewhere to live and we sort of settled down a little bit. But it, it took a little while because um, obviously scoring against them in the playoff final didn't go down too well with a few of them. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so I had to win them over a little bit. But yeah, just settling in, new strike partners, new team, how they play, you know, they play more football than what Tony did, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was like trying to adjust your game a little bit to the way they play. And um, yeah, luckily enough, I started most of the games that I was there and fit, fit to play. Yeah. And, you know, and every time I was fit to play, sometimes I didn't train a week and just played the Saturday because... They want me in the side. So when you when you play, you don't see that you're crucial to the team at all. You don't see you where you fit in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. As a player, and that's how I felt myself sometimes up there. I didn't feel like I was. Uh, what am I? Why am I playing for? You know. Okay. And that's, that's how I felt. But for some reason, the manager thought I was doing a good job. So you don't see that in yourself. And um, you know, and I was just. I didn't. You know, I was. I mean, I think Sean finished up with about forty goals, I think, and and I had quite a lot of assists in them. Yeah. Um, but it was it was surreal, you know. You get prior to the prem, you get your medal for your promotion, and you sit up, go out the balcony in the city, and you got forty, fifty thousand people in the, you know, in the square, all clapping yeah. you and everything like that. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, that must have been crazy. And why yeah. why did you leave them? Because I know there's there were rumours and it's sort of the, yeah. the story that um, Paolo Wincho coming in was the reason you left. But I'm led to believe that that wasn't the case. No, that's not the case at all. I was playing, I started pre-season at front, I was playing pre-season at front, you know, even played with George Weir at front, away at Oldham, and we got our promotion medals. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was flying, you know, I was 
I was so fit. As first pre season I've done, I was fit. I went to Ireland, uh, scored two at Linfield, won four nil out there, scored two there. And I was scoring goals again and enjoying my football. And, uh, you know, and I was flying and I went and just a, a family reasons, really. I was not going to go into that because I was getting angry over it. Um, <laughs> um, and it was like I was, I went to see Joe Raw because my, my ex wife was a bit unhappy up north and, I went to see him. He said, "I want you to stay at the club. You're playing for it very well at the moment. You're my third pick in the eleven. You know, and all this kind of thing. I'm bringing other players." He said, "But you know, you're playing so well pre-season." He said, "I can't can't leave you out at all." He said, "I brought you in." He said, "You're the player that I bought now." He went and uh, to play in the Premiership. And uh, I went, right, okay. So I said, "Let me have." Uh, and I was about to explain to him the situation. I went back to home, and she was just in tears. And um, and I went to see him again the following day after training. He goes, look, family comes first, I understand. But the only uh, thing is, if someone pays you for what we pay for you, then, then I'll let you go. But otherwise, no, you're staying here. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, about four hours later, there's about six or seven clubs put the same bid in for me. Right, OK, fair enough. Um, so I decided, went down to Wolves to speak. I spoke to a few clubs, went to Wolves because they're a bit further down the, uh, the M6 and that. And... Um, I didn't. I just felt it weren't right for me, but sort of like got pushed into that a little bit. Do you know what I mean? My hindsight to it, I wish I wouldn't have signed for him. To be honest. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. And like you say, you don't really want to go into it. But the the fact you missed out playing in the Premier League, that must have been gutted. Yeah, gutted. Been yeah, yeah, gutted. That was a thing for me, but um, not doing that. And 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 you know, later, later down the line, I realised that was a bad mistake to to do that. Um, because you know that's why she's my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 That's fair enough. Um, the move to Wolves meant a lot to you, um, in terms of your personal affiliation with the club, didn't it? All it was is I used to fo- like look, watch them play when I was younger because I liked uh, Bully and Mar- and Match up front for them years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was Andy Match and Steve Bull, and uh, and I liked you know the way they play and, and I just like to watch because they're good strikers and they score goals a lot. They're a good partnership together. Yeah. and I just remember watching them and that was the only attachment to Wolves was that really but I went to see him play on a on a, on a a night before I signed there and I just didn't feel right about it but I was getting there oh, come on you, you, do, you do well here do, do, do. and then they were telling me stuff and this kind of thing and, and getting there I got I got ambushed really inside it. and I, I didn't really want to sign sign but I did and then just I didn't get looked after when I was there and injuries and things like that and um, you know I was trying to play with a cramp there at the time as well during games you know a bad cramp is it's really painful yeah. and I was getting sent sent out there to play with cramp and I'd, I'd play, start the game with cramp you know because yeah. my calf muscles the blood was getting soft behind my knees because my calf was big so every time you go to push off the calf rises and busts all the blood vessels in the back behind your knee Okay. so the blood flow gets shut off so it bruises all your calf muscles yeah. so I could play about 20 minutes into a game and I couldn't even run couldn't go anywhere couldn't move and I just said oh, I've come off can't even get off the pitch and I was in, actually in both calf muscles and I'd come off the pitch and, and about 20 minutes later my calf, both calves would be black you know bruising all over them everywhere yeah. and um, they'd be going oh my god them calf I said oh you just need to have some uh, get that blood flowing through, <coughs> blood flowing through there I do some mass- massage with it and all that so they started massaging my class for three or four weeks and they go oh you're alright now you can go and play so I went back out there 20 minutes in the game the same thing happened yeah. and this went on for about six months this did yeah. so then by then I'm being labelled waste of money and all this kind of thing by the fans oh he can't even run anywhere you look at him donkey and this kind of thing and I'm thinking well I'm, I'm not fit to play Yeah. so and they shoved me out there to play and I want, I want to play but you can't play if you're not fit enough to play and in the end I just said look you know, I need some sorted out. So I went to a local doctor, to be fair, and he sent me in for an ultrasound scan done. And uh, and then he sorted it all out for me. And I had an operation about three days later. Yeah. On the on, beyond my knees, just to release the pressure on the calf muscle. Yeah. On both calves. Uh, so I was out for about eight weeks for that. Uh, started to come back with that. And then I um, uh, had a had a pain in my, in my uh, just below my ribs on my left side. And I kept on saying to him, I don't feel very well, I've got pains on my left side. And every time I get something fatty, oh, it's killing me all the time. I was throwing up and that kind of stuff. And I was getting the, uh, my local doctor to come out at 2 or 3 in the morning to give me morphine injections to kill the pain. Yeah. Sweating, couldn't breathe, all that kind of stuff. And this went on for eight months, this did. Yeah. 
So in the end, he'd done the same because they just said to me, go away on holiday. They sent me, they sent me away on holiday for two weeks to relax. Right. So they said, it's just stress, right? Okay. So I then come, I was phoning when I was away on holiday and said, look, I've, I'm in pain here. I can't even do nothing. You sent me to a lovely place. I said, but I'm in pain. Yeah. Oh, look, just chill out. I've drinked a few more Sam McGill's, I got told, right? <laughs> so then I phoned up the local doctor and I was look, when you come back, I'll do, we'll get an ultrasound to sort out for you now for the day you're back. You come the following day for the ultrasound scan. He said, we're getting you in for an operation. I said, well, what do you think it is? He said, you've got a gall, gallstones, gallbladder problem. Okay. So anyway, right, and he said to him straight away, right, so I went back, I got my follow, he went to have a scan, and I was saying, going, right, operation now. It was all going a funny colour inside me, the gallbladder was, and it was, it was like, um, I, I, I can't remember how they explained it, but it's, it could kill you, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, he, they rushed me in the afternoon. I had nothing to eat or nothing that day anyway. So I was just worried about what was going to happen. I had it that about three hours later, the operation, and um, and took my gallbladder out. That was like you're talking fourteen months a year of career. You know, not even done nothing in fourteen months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I tried to get my, I tried to get my medical records off the walls, all that kind of stuff, but then they all went missing. Okay. Funny enough, eh? Hey? They didn't even look after you. Didn't yeah. look after me. When I come back off of there, I was just going to the gym, getting myself fit. I'd go in at 10 in the morning for, for, for um, training. They used to train beside a tennis court, tennis club, and they used to go in the gym at the tennis club for all the boys that are like treat, getting treatment would go there and work out. I was just going in there for the next 10 months. I'd go in there and just work out 10 to 11 o'clock and go home. And for 10 months, not one person saw me at the club. Not one person. Really? Right. And I was in there, and I was in there with Andy Sinton, and he was exactly the same. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and then I just phoned up Jez Moxie on transfer deadline day in 2002, I think it was, on a, on a Thursday, uh, about half four. He had to do it by five o'clock. Half four, I said, I'm, I'm not coming back. And he goes, what? I said, I'm not coming back. He goes, why not? I said, well, look, I haven't done nothing in two and a half years or so. Your physios and your medical staff are awful. I said, they've ruined my career. And he goes... No, no, they haven't. No, they haven't. I said, I'll, go, I'll go tell you what. I said, I'm going to take you to the cleaners. I went to him like that, just joking. Yeah. And he goes, what can we do for you? What can we do for you then? And I said, well, just sort out the um, sort out my contract. And I said, no, that's done. I said, I shouldn't have signed anyway. Yeah. And he goes, sorry, sorry, you feel that way. He went, and then he sent a fax through. You could fax things through to them. He faxed through a, 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 a deal for me. And I said, I sent back saying no. And then I told him to it back what I wanted, and he sent back the same thing, said, OK. And then we just done a deal, done. Then I had to go and pick up. I wasn't even allowed to go to the club. I had to go to reception and pick up a cheque uh, one month, and then six months later, I go pick up another cheque. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't allowed to go and see anybody, so I had to go to reception and pick them up. That's crazy. That was it. I don't regret playing um, for the other clubs I played for. That's just what well, I only one regret I've got is that. Yeah. It's moving there. I went out on loan to get my because I come back with my calf muscles, and they sent me out on loan to get myself fit again. Yeah, uh, to get some gains under the belt because obviously I couldn't go straight into the team because I wasn't fit to play. But it just didn't didn't didn't, didn't work anyway. I'm still getting the pain from my calf, and I'm still getting it now. If I go for a run now, I still get pains in my calf. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So fair enough. And I do want to move on, but I know you did go back on loan to Gillingham. Um, yeah, one of those spells. Yeah. How was it the second time round? Um. It, it, it was okay I played out wide they played me wide I don't know why they played me wide it's um, one of the things where you know I think the damage would have been done to me at Wolves you see uh, everything yeah. you know just with the injuries and that kind of thing and they, uh, just lost interest really to be fair yeah fair enough I lost interest in the game and lost trust in people yeah fair enough and you did go on to play for the likes of Grimsby Scunthorpe etc but you never really settled like you say you fell out of love with the game injury problems that sort of thing um how how did it all come to an end? Um, I just I just because you were playing catch up, you know, um, you're playing catch up with us, and I've been injured for a little while now, and I still try to come back. And it broke down my hamstring as well, and um, you know, to all that, and to, as, as a little slight tear in Achilles. I was out, out for eight months with that, and I remember going up to Tony to to Stoke uh, when he was at Stoke. I went up there for eight months to get myself sort my Achilles out. Anyway, I started, I started training and everything with him and we played a couple of games on the pitch at Stoke uh, for his own. I played really well. He was playing me centre-half and he was going to think about playing me centre-half for the first team and that. And then I played in a reserve game and uh, I went ahead with a ball out of the box and my calf went again. You know, and I, I, and I just said to him, enough's enough. 
And I said, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. I just, it gets in your head when you can't play and play to your full potential. You get frustrated with it and think that's it, done. Yeah, yeah. So I just turned around and said, no, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And he said, okay, I understand and all that kind of thing. And uh, I didn't sign for nothing. I was just travelling up from, from Wolverhampton Wanderers from where I lived near Wolves up to, Man- up to Stoke to train for eight months. Yeah. Yeah. And get try and get fit for eight months. They won't pay me or nothing. I was I was doing it for nothing. So, you know, it's just it's just why I wanted to play again. But I just couldn't couldn't get myself you know, I was playing really well and doing well and training and the training was fine, but as soon as you go into the games where you've got to step up the, the movement, everything's like constant all the time in the game, you um it's just took its toll really. Yeah. And that was enough. Yeah. And I just said, No, that's it so then I just I quit playing. Yeah. Simple as that. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. And I know you you went into coaching, you do a little bit of coaching, etc. Um, did yeah. you always know you wanted to do that? No, not really. Just, it's just, um, I'll, I'll come back when I finish and I'll start doing a bit of coaching at Norwich and that with the development centres and uh, that kind of thing. And I've got managing my local team. I used to play for a while and they were struggling at the time. They were going to fold up the club were. So I just said, look, look, I'll, I'll um, manage the team. And they went, what? You come away from Birmingham. I was from Wolverhampton. I was still living at Wolverhampton. And he said, come, come here and train, uh, train the lads. I said, yeah, I'll come and train on Tuesday and play and manage on a Saturday. He said, oh, all right. So I was training back from Wolverhampton all the way to Watton on a Tuesday just to train them and then go back home again. Yeah. And then I'll come back on a Saturday and train them again because I didn't want the club to fold. Yeah. So the first year, the first, I got sorted them out pre-season. Then we got promoted that season. Uh, when the clubs didn't get folded, fold up. So we got promoted, won the league. And then, obviously, I've done well there. So Kings Lynn come call us do their reserves at Kings Lynn. So I went to Kings Lynn and done their reserves. Then the first team managers left after two weeks. So I was doing first team and reserves at the same time. Yeah. So that took up five or six days in a week. So I was really busy doing that. So then uh, I said, oh, I've had enough. And I left after about six months because I was doing both and it was just getting a bit too much. And, uh, and then I just took over Durham Town. Uh, football club and turned them around and now they've got up the levels now in the leagues and then I went up to this town who were with ours winners uh, a little while back and then um, I was sort of just doing with Watton I'm back at Watton now again yeah so yeah, yeah trying, to, trying, trying to sort them out <laughs> and how is it back at Watton and what, what's the project the project is to get them back up to where they were, you know, the old, the th- which is called the Thurl and Nun League. But they want to go further. They've got the facilities and that there to do it. It's great facilities, but it's just it's where um, money's a big thing. You know, we haven't got there's not a lot of money at the club and that kind of stuff. They don't we don't pay players or nothing like that. Yeah. It's just uh, players just want to play football and you you got to try and coach them and make them better, which I like doing. Um, but you know, we need we need some investment in there to 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 keep the club going. It's based at a sports centre, the local sports centre there. It's based there, so the facilities are fantastic. And uh, pitch and, and the, they've got lights and everything there as well. So it's just like they want to step back up again. So they want to get back into where they used to be and, and you know, be a be a good, you know, good club in a, in, in a, you know, a higher level of football. Yeah, yeah. All the best for that. And do you want to just talk to us a little bit about your agency stuff as well? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's um, funny old game is agency work. It's, um, it's just, I've got... So I asked if I'd go and do it by a couple of players. Would you do agency work? Because we'd, we'd trust you, that kind of thing. So, you know, because you played the game, we'd trust you, we know you, this kind of thing. So I, I sort of thought, all right, I would do that. So I started up my own business and so I started doing it about three years ago. And um, it's been, a, you see a different side of football in that, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of cowboys out there and... Uh, yeah, and there's a lot of cowboy managers too out there. I won't, won't say names, but there's a lot out there. Yeah. And, um, you know, you deal with and then they stitch you up. So I'm not going to say too much about that. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so you try and be fair and try and do it right. You won't make them make their money. If you're a rogue and do it all wrong, you'll make money. And that's, that's the life. And people stitch each, each other up and that kind of thing in it. And I think it's poor. Yeah, you know, you try, you put your trust in someone, and they let you down and do their own thing, and you know. But it's it's where you learn stuff, you learn from it, like you do when you play football. You learn, and you try and change it and do it your own way, and and um, deal with people who you trust, you know, all day long. But yeah, it's going okay. Just got you know, it's, it's one of the things you can't do much now at the moment because nothing's going on. And you can't contact no one, so yeah, course, yeah. it's, it's 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 really hard. But you know, on the other hand, I still got my you know, doing bits and other things as well. So I like to keep myself busy. Yeah, 
yeah, that must be quite frustrating when you're in it to sort of help the players and then you've got people that are in it for themselves, that sort of thing. So I can understand that frustration. Oh, yeah, they are just in it for themselves they get to make the money. Just as soon as they say, you say, yeah, I've got a player for like, um, what am I going to get out of it then? Straight away. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about money with them all and I'm just thinking myself, God, for my sake, just think about the player for once. Yeah. You know, think yeah. about the player, not about your pocket all the time. Yeah. And it's just, it's just scary how many agents out there are like that. It is amazing. I put the phone down and ask them and just say, look, I'm not talking to you. Yeah. Because everything they say, what's, so you say, they go, what's my fee? And it's like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. get, just get on with it. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I never. I think it's never good if the if the agent's the one making the headlines. It shouldn't be like that, really, should it? So uh, no, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be at all. It shouldn't be at all. It's just, oh, it's just this um, scary. I've got a player, Conor Randall, who's at Liverpool. He's uh, in Bulgaria, and he's just he's just now got um, he's now coming back to England, and he's. Um, He's, on, he's just been paid up because they can't afford to pay him his wages anymore so they've paid him up and he's now without a club but he can't come home to do anything because he's stuck out there because the the, um, the yeah. coronavirus yeah. so he can't he, he can't come home at the moment so he's yeah. stuck out there they've paid him up till June uh, some of his money up till June they come to agreement and now he's stuck out there in, in Bulgaria and he can't get home well yeah I imagine that's far, so, far from ideal really it's just frustrating for him and uh, he just wants to come back to England and play um, so Steve Evans is listening Conor Randall is free <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely absolutely. If, if you need a CDM or a right wing back he's your man well look at those positions one of CDM's on on loan and the other one's right back's 35 so you never know um, yeah you never know you never know you never know um, just quickly because obviously we're short for time but what's what's the yeah. aim um, aim for your future what, what do you want to do um, I don't know really I just want to enjoy my life for really. the rest of my life what's left of it <laughs> yeah um, for me I just want to just join my family I've got at the moment uh, my new partner my kids and everything like that my other kids I've got my ex-wife and everything like that I just want to enjoy my time with them and um, hopefully stay alive for, uh, through this uh, pandemic and the same for everybody else uh, you know uh, just everyone to stay safe and, and you know and keep the self-distancing because and that's the killer at the moment for you know everybody in England at the moment is people not listening to the government. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but absolutely. at the end of the day, yeah, I just want um, to be happy and just you know just a normal person, just earning a normal living yeah. like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to ask you one final question. It's something we started asking everyone that comes on. Um, could we see you back at Gillingham in any form at any point in the future? Yeah, yeah, we do. I come down there. Yeah, I'm supposed to come down. Um, I think it was in April this this month coming down there. Okay. Uh, I think the eight, I think it was the eighteenth. I think or something. I was supposed to come down right. um, and see a game and got invited down. But you know, I would do next season. Come down and see you know, a few games. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be brilliant. Um, Bob, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your time, and I wish you all the best of everything. No problem. Cheers. Thanks, Liz. So that's that for this episode of JFG Mees. I'd like to give another huge thank you to Bob for taking the time out of his day to chat to me. Please do like the video if you enjoyed and feel free to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel as well. Please check out all of our other platforms which can be found in the description and do let us know anyone else related to the club that you think we should get on the show in the future. We do have a few episodes lined up already so keep an eye out for those and please check out all of our previous episodes as well if you fancy it. See you soon.